number of the scripture that we're going to cover that corresponds to the Pew Bible in front of you on the back of the outline that, that we have. So if you don't know where the books are in the Bible, don't sweat it. Just grab a Pew Bible in front of you, and I got the page numbers right there. Just turn to the, the page number. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, this is the day that you have made, Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in it, Father. And Lord, I pray for each and every person who is here today. May you minister to us. May you touch our hearts. May you just breathe into us and encourage us. And Father, we want to worship you here today in spirit and in truth. Father, into your hands, I pray uh, that you would just use everything here today for your glory. May you be lifted up. May you be exalted here. Father, give me your words to proclaim this morning. Speak through me. Let me be your instrument. Give us ears to hear, a willing spirit to respond, and faith to move out to what you call us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago, there's a movie that came out called The Bucket List. Anyone see that, uh, The Bucket List? And the basic premise was about two guys who, who uh, uh, were faced with a terminal illness, and they had about a year to live. So they came up with a bucket list of things that they wanted to accomplish before they, they died. Some of it was skydiving and uh, racing cars and bungee jumping. And, and what you may not know is that book was based on, I mean, that, that movie was based on a, a, a book, 100 Things to Do Before You Die. And the author of that book, a couple of years after the movie came out, uh, fell in his home, hit his head, and died at the age of 47. And his family said he accomplished about 50 things that he wanted to of the 100 things to do before you die. But, you know, it reminds us that life is uncertain, isn't it? You know, we, we all have an end coming to our lives. And what are some things that you want to accomplish before you die? How can you make the most of your life in, in this world? And, and in light of these two questions, let me ask you two very important questions. Who are you, and why are you here? I don't mean here. I mean, why are you alive? Why are you on the planet Earth? Now, you could ask Christians or non-Christians alike, and some will say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know who I, who I am. Some people think life is all about filling that bucket list. Some people think life is all about making as much money as possible before you, you die or having as much fun as possible before you die. Now, should it matter who Jesus says who we are and why we're here? You think, you think it would matter, wouldn't it? Well, if you, if you would, turn to John 15, and Jesus tells us who we are, and he tells us why we're here. In John 15, verses 1 through 8, page 1643 in your pew Bible. Page 1643 in your pew Bible. Jesus says, are you with me? We all good? I am the vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man or woman remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So in this passage here, Jesus tells us who we are. He says, you're the branches. Have you ever considered yourself a branch? That's probably not how you would define yourself. Who are you? I'm a branch. Why are you here? Jesus tells us why we're here. 
to go bear fruit. That's what a branch does. A branch bears fruit. So I know this is not what we think about of ourselves from day to day, but the Lord has called us to bear fruit and not fulfill our our bucket list and not to be results-oriented. What's the difference between results and fruit? Well, results maybe are the number of friends you have on Facebook, whereas fruit are the number of souls that you have been instrumental in winning for Christ. Results are maybe uh, uh, temporary, whereas fruit is, is eternal. Results can be achieved by man. Fruit is achieved by God. And results can be religious substitute for fruit. Well, I, I got to stress that again, because the devil will emphasize results over fruit. For example, you get some pastors in the same room, and they discuss the three B's. I'm serious. I'm serious. You get pastors in the same room, they discuss the three B's. How big's your building? Talk about the building. How big's the sanctuary? And in a sense, the church can become an idol, can't it? Right? How big's your budget? How much money are you guys making? How much money are you taking in? And then uh, bodies. How many people in your church? How many? Yeah. I remember uh, um, serving in a nursing home. I was going through clinical pastoral education. And there was the chaplain there ministering to about eight, eight elderly people. And he was just singing hymns, leading them in worship. And I'm just sitting there thinking, you know what? I bet you the Lord is just as pleased with this guy here as a guy who leads a megachurch. Right? Just as pleased, because look how faithful he is, just leading these people in worship. And just, you know, I, I, I was led in worship as he was leading in worship. You see, the Lord is not concerned about bodies, budget, and buildings. That's, that's not who he's concerned about. In fact, there was a church in Laodicea that was a big church, that was a mega church, that was on, uh, 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 had a great uh, budget, they had a lot of money. In fact, this isn't our main passage, but I do want you to look at it. Look at Revelation 3.17. Uh, keep your place in John. John's our main passage, but look at Revelation 3.17, page 1870 in your pew Bible. Revelation 3.17, the church at Laodicea. I, I think the church at Laodicea was great at producing results. They, they were a rich church. They had a lot of money. They had an eye salve there that you would put on your eyes. Mostly had healing properties. And they had uh, uh, purple linen. They had expensive clothing in, in, in that area. Uh, very wealthy, great clothing, an eye salve. Uh, but it was all about results. They had no fruit. Revelation 3.17 The Lord says, you say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and don't need a thing. Boy, that describes some churches today. They're so wealthy, uh, they just accomplish everything with with the almighty dollar. But you do not realize that you're wretched. You're pitiful and you're poor. Now, the church is saying we're rich, but Jesus is saying, no, you're poor. And then they have that eye salve that they would put on their eyes for healing property. And that's why uh, the Lord says, you know what? You think you're rich, but you're poor, and you're blind. And then you're naked because they boasted in their great expensive clothing. So all the things, all the results that they had that they thought were great, the Lord discounted. Why? Because it was results. It wasn't fruit. We're here to bear fruit. Fruit is, what man, uh, is not what man can do. Fruit is what God can do. Fruit has eternal significance. So this morning, I want to look at three truths about bearing fruit. Number one, bearing fruit manifests in various ways. And we're going to go through this pretty quick. The first way is by winning souls to Christ. There's three eternal things in this world. God, God's Word, and the souls of men and women. That's the three eternal things in in this world. Proverbs 11.30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. You see, soul winning is not optional for, for Christians. Imagine you had maybe a week to live, and you gathered your family together, 
and you wanted to speak to them one last time, what would you say? Would you talk about how the cowboys are doing? No? Would you talk about trivial things, or would you talk about what matters most in your life and in your heart? You see, in Matthew 28, verse 18 and 20, I think every Christian should know this passage. Every Christian should have this passage memorized. Why? Because it's Jesus' last meeting with the disciples. It's at Jesus' last meeting where he expressed what was most important on his heart to his disciples and the church. So let, let's look at it briefly. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, page 1521 in your pew Bible. And just so you know, I've never won anybody to Jesus Christ. I've never won anyone to the Lord. But I've been around when the Holy Spirit has. I've allowed the Holy Spirit to use me to win people to Christ. Then Jesus came to, are you with me? This is called the what? The Great Commission, not the Great Omission. The Great Commission. This is Jesus' last business meeting with his disciples. He's expressing what's on his heart, the most important thing. And he says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. That's our job as Christians. We're, we're to make disciples. Disciples making more disciples. Being soul winners for Christ. What does it say about a church that the parking lot is full, they have a big budget, they have a big, big building, bodies, big budget, but they're not winning souls for Christ? What does it say about that church? I'd say it's not right in the eyes of God. And what, what, Maybe you say, you know what, but I just don't feel led to win souls for Christ then you're not being led by the Lord. Because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus gave us a great commission to go and make disciples. You don't have to be an evangelist like Billy Graham. All you got to do is tell people what Christ did for you. All you got, in fact, if you don't know how to share your faith, I encourage you to come to the picnic this afternoon. In fact, invite some, invite some people to the picnic this afternoon. One o'clock, Landau Park, Pavilion Number 16. And I'll teach you out there. We're going to go over the story of the beads. And I'll teach you out there how to share the gospel just using different colored beads. It, it, it's really simple. But the Lord calls all of us to, to win souls for Christ. Second thing, the second way we manifest fruit. First way is winning souls for Christ. Second is by sharing with those in need. Look at Romans 15. Verse 25, Romans 15, 25. All right. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution to the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and make sure that they have received this, what? Fute, fruit, contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. Paul basically said that their offering was fruit, their contribution was fruit. Taking care of the poor and those in need is important to Jesus. And you know what, as a church, unfortunately we need money to do that, don't we? We need money to do that. In Matthew 25, verse 37 through 40, Jesus said, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger, invite you in or need clothes or clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison or go visit you? And the king will reply, I'll tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. I, I wish I had more time to share my heart. Uh, time is getting away from us. But I can assure you that with our building program, I am not about big buildings. 
In fact, the last thing I want to do is build. The last thing I want to do is build. But it may be necessary to build because I would rather we use our money to minister to the poor. I would rather we use our money to clothe the naked. I would rather we use our money rather than build a building. But you know, it it comes to a point where we're going to have to build a building. But I can assure you this, it's not going to be anything elaborate. I I can assure you that. We're not going to waste money on building a mega church. What I would like to do is build a mega homeless shelter. Or a mega soup kitchen. That's, that's what I'd like to do. But we do need a building where we come here and we gather together and we worship and serve the Lord. And, but this isn't the church. We need to be church outside of, of the church walls. And then the third way we manifest fruit is by de- developing Christ-like character. That's God's purpose for you, till Christ is formed within you. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's a package deal. Notice it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. In other words, let me see, love, joy, peace. Okay, on Monday I'll show love. On Tuesday I'll show joy. No, it, it's a package deal. So how do, we, how do we love people that aren't lovable? How do we have joy and peace in the midst of a a dark and and perilous time, a distressing time? How do we do that? Stay connected to the vine. Pray. You see, how can a branch bear fruit? Does the branch sit on the tree saying, "Mm, I got to bear fruit? (laughs) Is that what it does? No. All it has to do is stay connected to the vine. That's all it has to do. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Our job is to stay connected to the vine and to bear fruit. How do we bear fruit? By praying, someone said, by reading God's word, by staying, doing our best to stay connected to the vine. Sin will short circuit your connection to the vine. Definitely will stop the, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the, the juice of the Holy Spirit flowing in and through your lives. Until you get right with with God again. And then the fourth way, we glorify God. And this sort of leads to what we were just talking about. John 15, 8. If you would, turn back to John 15, 8. The fourth way we manifest fruit is by glorifying God. By glorifying God. Look at John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing to yourself to be my disciples. Do you think God wants to work through you to produce fruit? And I'm talking godly fruit. And what am I talking? You know, in the the Old Testament, sometimes the Lord would would give blessings, material blessings upon people. And he may do that today, and he may not. But I can say this, that when you're walking in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you will have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These things will be evident in your lives. And you know what? A a, a Christian walking through this world that has love, joy, and peace will shine like a bright light in the midst of the darkness and despair in this world. I can assure you that. And that brings God glory. That brings Him glory. He wants to work through you to bring Him glory. Why are you here? To bring God glory. That's why you're here. What's the catechism confession? I can't remember the old Presbyterian catechism confession. Uh, The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, right? I can't remember. Something like that, right? And then another way we, uh, we glorify God is by reading his word. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Revelation 1, verse 3, page 1866 in your pew Bible. So how do you receive God's blessings? God wants to bless you so that you bear much fruit. How do you receive God's blessings? The first way is what I'm going to show you right now is by reading God's word. Revelation 1, 3 says, Blessed are the ones who read the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it because the time is near. You know, the very word blessed here, you know what it means? 
Happy, exactly. Happy. How many of you would like to be happy? Yeah, all of us. We're searching for happiness. But it's only found when we're walking in obedience to what the Lord has called us to do. And we hear the word of God and obey. And the second way we receive God's blessings is you ask him. Ask him. The Bible says you have not because you, you ask not. In, in 1 Chronicles 4.10, Jab- Jabez cried out, Oh Lord, would you bless me? You understand something. We don't ask for God's blessings just so we can have a nice, comfortable life. We don't ask for God's blessings just to hoard these blessings. You know why the Dead Sea is dead? Because it has no output. God blesses you to bless others. He'll shovel in the blessings, and you can try to shovel them out, but his shovel is bigger, I promise you. And he blesses you so that you could be a blessing to others. So ask him. Ask him. And then the third way is through obedience to his word. Obedience to his word. Uh, Psalm 512 says, For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Now, how can we possibly be righteous before God? That would mean we're morally perfect. Matthew 5, verse 48, Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So what's the moral standard Jesus has set for us? What's the moral standard? Perfection. Who's perfection? He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father. So the moral standard is we're to be morally as perfect as God. Wow, how can we possibly do that? Uh, And then Jesus goes on to express that even our wrong attitudes are sinful. Because he, he goes on to say, you know what, if you're angry with your brother or sister, it's like you commit murder. He says if you just lust after another woman, just look after another woman lustfully, he says it's as if you commit adultery within your heart. So he goes on to even, even say that our attitudes, even the wrong attitudes are, are improper and wrong. So moral perfection, God's moral perfection, how can we possibly achieve that? That's the standard God has set for us. You know what we do? We compare ourselves to other people. Man, I'm not as bad as him. I'm not... Right? I remember seeing a special on TV where the guy was in jail saying, you know, I may be in here for this and this, but I'm not as bad as that guy in the other cell. I'm thinking, where are you at? <laughs> but, but don't we do that? We compare ourselves with other people to make ourselves feel pretty good. But what's the standard God is going to judge us by? He says, that you're to be morally perfect as God is morally perfect. I cannot achieve that. Try as hard as I might, I cannot achieve that. You cannot achieve that. So we all have a problem, don't we? The good news is 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. So how are you made righteous? Through Jesus Christ. God made him who had no sin to be sin for you and me so that we could become righteous. I am perfect before God, because when God looks at me now, he sees Jesus Christ in my heart and in my life, and it's on that basis alone that I'm I'm accepted, amen? And then fifthly, we manifest fruit by the good works that produce lasting fruit. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last. We're called to bear fruit that will last. And what is the fruit that will last? Well, it's winning souls to Christ. It's sharing with those who need, developing Christ-like character, glorifying God. And then secondly, number two in your handout, bearing fruit is dependent upon abiding in Christ. I pretty much already explained that, didn't I? We're to stay connected to the vine. I remember there was a lady when I was in the military, I lived next to her. After Christmas, she took her Christmas tree and planted it. But it was already cut off. So it had no root system. You know, that tree was dead because it was separated from the roots. It had all appearances of being alive, though, didn't it? 
You know, in the ground, you couldn't tell that tree from one tree from another, a dead tree from a live tree. You know, some Christians were separated from our roots. Our job is to stay connected to the vine. He says, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. For any plant to grow, we need topsoil. In America, our topsoil, did you know our topsoil is disappearing? Through modern agriculture, commercial development, and wind and water, it's reported that more than a foot of precious topsoil has been removed. Yet, have you noticed? Have any of us noticed that a foot of the precious topsoil is... No. Why? Because it happens one grain at a time. It happens so slowly over time, we don't really realize it. You know, I believe in America here, our topsoil has been removed. Let me read to you something. The New England Confederation of 1643 says this. The New England, understand, New England is now one of the darkest places spiritually. And the New England Confederation of 1643 told of America's high purpose as we were just starting out as a nation. And it says, we all came to the parts of America with the same end and aim to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. How far we have fallen. How far we have fallen as a nation. How far we have gotten away from God. But it happened one grain at a time. As Jesus told the church at Ephesus, remember the height from which you have fallen. He says, return to me. Remember how far you have fallen. And I don't know what's going on in your spiritual life, but maybe the topsoil has been eroding in your spiritual life. Don't let sin wash away the topsoil in your life so that you can't bear fruit that you can't get a good root system. Jesus says, return to me. Remember the height from which you have fallen. And then thirdly, bearing fruit, it's natural for a follower of Jesus Christ. As I said, the branch just doesn't say, oh, I got to bear fruit, I got to bear fruit. It automatically bears fruit by just staying connected to the vine. So if you're a Christian, should you be bearing fruit? Yeah, absolutely. All you got to do is stay connected to the vine. Every one of us, what, why are you here? To bear fruit. Who are you? You are a branch. You're here to bear fruit. That's why God has you here, because it's to the Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Now, there's a passage I want to take us to, and then I got to close. Matthew 7, 15, page 1478 in the Pew Bible. Matthew 7, 15, page 1478 in the Pew Bible. Watch out for false prophets. Now, this is Jesus talking. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. He says, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. If you're connected to the vine, you cannot help but bear good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. You know why? Because it's not connected to the vine. It's not connected to Jesus Christ because Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. So if they're not connected to the vine, they cannot bear good fruit. It's cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I believe we are called to be fruit inspectors. Now, I know in my life, you know, sometimes I produce bruised fruit. I go through a season, my fruit is bruised. I, I, I mess up sometimes. But what is the consistent fruit in my life? What is the consistent fruit? Now, if I'm consistently uh, producing uh, apples, and I say I'm an orange tree, what, what really am I? I'm an orange. It doesn't matter. I could say I'm producing apples all day long. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So let me ask you this. I want to to leave you with this question. This is going to be hopefully a burning question. 
If Jesus were to look at your fruit right now, what would he see? What would he see? What would he find? What are you doing with your life? Why are you here? Do you think he's care, he cares about how much money you have in the bank? Do you think he cares how big your house is, how big your car is, how many friends you have on Facebook or in real life? Do you think he cares if you catch Pokemon or whatever? <laughs> Amazing how some people spend their time, right? Get this, get this. Everything that you're striving for, everything that you're stressing about, Everything you're stressing about, everything that you're striving for, you know what? When you die, you can't take it with you. Can't take it with you. Someone else is going to get it. How's that make you feel? The only three things that will last, God's word, God, and the souls of men and women. So why not invest your life in eternal fruit? Quit chasing your tail. Quit chasing after the things that really have no significance or importance in life. Somehow we've gotten, we bought off on the idea that, you know what? The American dream is what it's about. I want to achieve the American dream. I want to have the big house, the big car, the white picket fence. That's the American dream. And we bought off on that. And you know what's happened is we have become a slave to our possessions. We don't own things. They own us. They own us. We become a slave to our possessions. Jesus said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I don't have a house. Why? Because this world was not his home, and this world is not your home. Don't get comfortable here. And use what God has blessed you to advance his kingdom. Because that's the only way that a church can effectively reach this world for Jesus Christ. You know what the church has done? We have abdicated our responsibility to the government. We say it's up to the government to care for the poor. Really? Jesus said it's your responsibility, church. That's our job, but we can't do it if if people aren't given to the church. We're to give generously to the church. And I can assure you that as long as Gloria's here and Carolyn's here and I'm here and the others on, uh, they're hard with the money. They they will not spend (laughs) frivolously uh, uh, They'll be good stewards of, of what God has blessed us with. And I assure you that we'll use it for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray that as you inspect our fruit, Lord, Father, I pray that you'll, you'll see in our lives fruit that will last, Lord, that we'll, we'll focus on the things that are important in life and not the things that are passing away. Yes, we have bills to pay and we have to put food on the table and we need a roof over our head. But Father, help us to discern the difference between wants and needs. And help us to remember that your word says that we're to seek your kingdom first and your righteousness And if we'll make your business our business, then you promise to take care of our needs. You promise to to, uh, feed us. You promise to clothe us. You promise to take care of us. So, Father, let us not get focused on filling our bucket list. Father, I pray that each of us can, can hear as Jesus heard, Father, Lord, as you spoke from heaven, this is my Son, whom I am well pleased. And Father, I pray that when you look at our lives, that you can say the same thing. And Lord, you have shown us here this morning how we can get there, how we can do it. Help us to live a life that is pleasing to you and bearing fruit through good works. Lord, we place ourselves at your feet, and we ask that you have your way in our lives for your glory. We don't want to live one more second for the devil. We don't want to live one more second for ourselves. We don't want to live one more second for the temporary things of this world that are fading away. So help us to reprioritize our lives. Help us to do a a paradigm shift to see this world through your lens, through your focus. And remember, our time here is but brief. And our time here is uncertain. 
So let us number our days wisely in service to you. So that when we stand before you, we'll hear those beautiful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You respond this morning as the Lord leads you this morning. Maybe you just need to come up here and pray and rededicate your life. Maybe you want to join our church body. Maybe you want to follow through in baptism. I don't know. But I know the Lord has spoken to you this morning, so you respond as the Lord leads you this morning. And we're going to have a time of invitation. This is your opportunity to respond to what the Lord has placed upon your heart. Let's stand together. We'll sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love Thee. I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee be wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and say when the death dew lies cold on my brow if Thank you for worshiping together but before we sing our parting song i hope you're going to the picnic and if you don't know where landa park is go to i-35 head to new Braunfels, get off at highway 46 and turn left the downtown new Braunfels is on the west side of the highway turn left stay on 46 and about a mile or two down 46 you'll see a sign landa park on the right and if you drive past something that looks like a park you went too far we have some maps uh, for where the pavilion is in the park. It is soon after you turn in, but you'll need to drive past the pavilion, park on the left, and then walk back toward the pavilion. We look forward to seeing you there to continue our fellowship, have some fantastic lunch, share the gospel, play some games, sweat a little bit, eat a lot of food. In fact, you know what? Let's thank God for the food right now. Yeah, yeah we're going to have a wonderful concert. It, I promise you, it is going to be time well spent. And uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the time we've already shared with each other and with you. Pray, Lord, you'll bless this lunch that we're going to share there in the park. And may your love just spill out from us to everyone who is there. We would love for you to bear fruit in this event today. For your glory, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Grab a hand. Let's sing the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. 
I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God.